Good morning. That's so good. I didn't have to say it but once. Good morning. Welcome to the culminating worship service and sermon talkback session for the 2023 Bandy Preaching Conference theme, Context Matters Reads the Room. We also want to welcome the admitted students who are visiting with us today. They're over here. So this is how we always have chapels. I just wanted to let you know that. Our preacher this morning is a native of Chicago, the son of the late Dr. Alvin Wesley and Dr. Helena Wesley, a fourth generation Baptist minister. He attended the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools, graduated magna cum laude from Duke University with a Bachelor of Science in Biomedical and Electrical Engineering. While in medical school, Dr. Wesley yielded to the call of God and walked away from the path to a medical career to attend seminary. He attended Boston University School of Theology, where he was Martin Luther King Jr. Scholar and summa cum laude graduate in Biblical Studies and African American Religious History. He holds a Doctor of Ministry in Preaching from Northern Baptist Seminary. In 2021, Dr. Wesley received an honorary Doctor of Humane Letters from Stillman College and Tuvalu College, respectively. Paul writes to the Romans, but how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim them? Marking his 15th year, the eighth pastor in the 219th year history of Alfred Street Baptist Church in Alexandria, Virginia. The church has grown from 2,500 members to 10,000 members. That's not counting all the online members and used to be and I'm coming back kind of members that he has. 80 active ministries with an emphasis on children's ministry and missions. Since 2020, Alfred Street Baptist Church under the guidance and director, direction of Dr. Wesley, through the Tithe the Tithe Initiative has donated $5.4 million to over 200 organizations. His sons, Howard John II Deuce and Cooper Reese are the joys of his life. He's an avid golfer, a moviegoer, a spades player, a spades player, a spades player, <laughs> an aspiring chef. <laughs> is a lifetime member of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. But not all have obeyed the good news from Isaiah. Lord, ha who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley is a gift in rhetorician, a disciplined exegete, a creative thinker, a community builder, a wise mentor, a prophetic voice, a lifelong learner, a compassionate friend, a passionate teacher, an anointed pastor, a humble spirit, and most importantly, he is a child of God. Please pray with and for him as today he shares the message that God has infused in his soul for such a time as this. Good morning. Please rise as you are able for our call to worship. Such a blessing to be here, house of God. Oh God, who has met us in this place. Oh God, who has loved us. O oh God, who has liberated us. Let us pray. Eternal light, who is the lifter of our countenances, thank you for the gift of worshiping in community. We pray now that our hearts would be softened to acknowledge and experience your presence in this place. So we declare, have your way, O oh God. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in this moment of worship. That this would be a space for divine transformation and spiritual reclamation. In your name we pray, amen. Let us join together in the great hymn of the church, 
near the cross. scripture reading from the Gospel of Matthew. 
These are the names of the 12 apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother, Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. The word of God for the people of God. anybody out here that knows that we don't have a reason to fear that no matter what the obstacle comes no matter what hardship that we shall not be afraid if we put our trust in God
children of God, grace and peace be unto you. From God who loves us as mother and father and Jesus Christ, who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning and our returning redeemer. I thank the Lord for this blessed privilege and opportunity to stand on these sacred grounds of Candler School of Theology to share with you my convictions about Jesus and the grace of God. To all the faculty, administrative and leadership of this school and particularly to a woman who I consider both a mentor in ministry and a model of discipleship, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Fry Brown. I give thanks to God for the invitation to be here today. I texted her the other day and she responded and I told my mother I knew I was gonna be somebody when I grew up. Whenever Dr. Brown replies to your text messages, you know you are somebody. Um, I solicit your prayers as we gather in this space to remind ourselves of the necessity and the importance of context and proclamation. With that in mind, I seek to blend the context of the conference with the context of these final days of Lent that we are in and a gathering of those who have sacrificed other options for the divine call of God on your life, and in the presence of those who are just admitted and don't yet know what they've gotten into. <laughs> Won't you pray with me? Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It was the mystic theologian Howard Washington Thurman, mentor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., professor at Morehouse, dean of the chapel at Boston University School of Theology, author of one of my sacred texts outside of the Bible, Jesus and the Disinherited, who said, and I paraphrase, that life really boils down to two simple questions. Where am I going and who's going with me? In that question, Howard Thurman emphasized that the character and caliber of our lives are really determined and impacted, affected by the associations that we keep. Dr. Thurman understood the necessity of positive and productive relationship to achieve and accomplish whatever God has assigned on your life. Indeed, the words of God to Adam still ring with relevance in this room today, that it's not good for us to be alone. And Professor Leonard Sweet put it best when he said, you need others to get the job done. We see that in crystal clarity in the life of Jesus our Christ particularly in his selection of this ragtag group of 12 men who would help him get the job done. The listing and naming of these 12 disciples shows up in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. It's in Mark 3, it's in Luke 6. But I highlight Matthew's version because Dr. Brown, Matthew for me pulls together two of the most disturbing, difficult, <clears throat> depressing, and even discouraging words, especially for us who have yielded to the call of God to serve the people of God. Two words Matthew uses that, that ought to cause us to pause with some prayerful reflection of whether this is really what we want to do with our lives. Two words that come at the end of that scripture that was read. It's the title of this little sermon, and Judas. And Judas. The selection of Jesus, these 12 men, in chapter 10 is really brought on by the reality of something he realizes at the end of chapter 9. At the end of chapter 9, we find that Jesus our Christ has been traveling, preaching, teaching, 
and healing in all the synagogues throughout the region of Galilee. And in the midst of travel and teaching and preaching and healing, he comes to this conclusion in a scripture that we're all familiar with. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So Jesus sets out to choose these 12 for really one simple purpose. Why does Jesus choose 12? I know, I know you're seminary trained. You're going to tell me about the theological significance of 12. You're going to tell me how it mirrors the 12 tribes of Israel and that each one of the disciples was in the mosaic line of the calling. No, no, it's even more simple than that. Jesus chose 12 because he needed some help. Jesus needs some help. I want to make certain you catch this, that the one who's approved by God at the Jordan River needs some help. The one who, after 40 days of fasting, could still defeat the devil in three rounds with a TKO needs some help. The water walker. You remember that turning wine from water thing. You remember that raising of the dead thing. You remember that opening of the blind. That brother says, I need some help. Jesus comes to the reality of what I want to press on you today, and that is that God's full assignment on your life is always going to be greater than your human ability. That whatever God has called you to requires some help. If you can do it all by yourself, it ain't what God called you to do. If you don't need anybody to help you get the job done, you ain't trying to do enough. If no one needs to pray for you, your vision is too small. That the assignment of God is always bigger than our own human. God has a way of calling us to do that which requires partnership and assistantship from other people in our lives. And I'll suggest to you that no matter how sanctified you are, no matter what your GPA is, if you're on your way out of here from summa cum laude to just thank you laude, wherever you are on the spectrum, that if Jesus needed help, you do too. I can prove it to you. I know you probably heard the reading of that scripture and wondered what in the world can you pull out of a list of names like that? If you just saw the names that Jesus chose, you miss the real power of the most repeated word in those verses. The most repeated word is not a name. The most repeated word is the Greek conjunction chi, which we translate as and. Look at how Matthew gives us the names. It's not Peter and Andrew. It's Peter and Andrew. It's James and John. It's Philip and Bartholomew. It's Thomas and Matthew. It's James and Thaddeus. It's Simon and Judas. Because Matthew understood what I press on you, and that is that everyone called of God needs some and. And don't you dare leave this campus without knowing who your and is. Who has God partnered you with? Who has God called into your life? Who has God associated and affiliated you with to help you with the assignment that God has given? Everybody needs somebody sometime. Your Bible may be bigger than mine. You may be able to quote everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation last. You may know even the third verse of the hymns. You may have enough oil in your purse to anoint yourself to you as greasy as a thigh from KFC. But at the end of the day, everybody needs somebody. Now, if you understand why Jesus chose them, you can better understand who they are. If I teach Bible for a moment, since there are some New Testament professors in the room, when you look at the life of Jesus, the people around Jesus fell into different categories. On the one hand, there's a group that the Bible refers to as the multitude. Sometimes they say the crowd. The crowd, the crowd, the crowd was not committed to Jesus. They were fascinated by Jesus. But the crowd was fickle and flaky. The crowd could holler Hosanna on Sunday. But by Friday, crucify him. You've got the crowd. Then you've got another group called the disciples. 
Now, don't make the disciples the 12 because there were many who were disciples that didn't make the list of the 12. Martha was a disciple. She bankrolled the whole thing. Wouldn't have been no ministry without Martha. Mary was a disciple. She sits at the feet of Jesus in the posture of one who is studying and learning from a rabbi. Nicodemus was a disciple. He was a Pharisee, part of the Sanhedrin council, the last person you would have thought, but he was a disciple. So you've got the crowd, then you've got the disciples. Then you've got the 12, those who were named and mentioned. Then there's another group called the apostles, and sometimes we make those synonymous, but according to Luke, when you get to the book of Acts, the apostles are also the 11 minus Judas, but the addition of Matthias, those who received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost to go out and preach the message of Jesus Christ. So the disciples and the apostles are subtly different from one another. You got the crowd, you got the disciples, you got the 12, you got the apostles, then you got the inner three, the executive committee, Peter, James and John. You'll find there sometimes when Jesus had work to do, he didn't take all 12 because nine of them couldn't be counted on, but he took three of them with him. Which I had a Bible reader. When he goes up on the Mount of Transfiguration to meet Elijah and Moses, he don't take everybody. Peter, James, and John. When he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane for a prayer pause on his way to Calvary, he don't take everybody. Peter, James, and John. You've got the three. You've got the apostles, you've got the 12, you've got disciples, you've got the crowd, and then you've got the beloved disciple. There's only one of him. Him was John. You remember that thing at the cross when none of the other 12 were there except for John, and Jesus looks out and sees his mama and sees John and has a good idea. He says, mama, you take care of John. John, you take care of mama, because the beloved disciple was the only one that was there at the cross. Let me just tell you that it's amazing when you look at the life of Jesus and the people associated with Jesus, the closer he got to the cross, the smaller the circle became. Isn't it amazing that the more you journey towards the purpose of God in your life, think it not strange that God purges people. That God edits associations, that God removes relationships, that God will cut contacts, that, that as you get closer to calling and purpose, the crowd always dwindles down. And I have to say that because you're in seminary, you're preparing yourself to serve. And I came by to tell you, crowds don't confirm purpose. In a time when we are obsessed with mega and membership, don't think that because she's got 10,000 members that God is in it. I knew this was going to get quiet here. Um, because many of you have been raised in a social media context that has you chasing celebrity and infatuated with numbers, but Jesus teaches us that crowds don't confirm purpose. And that our assignment is not to get followers on our page, but teach people how to follow Jesus. That just because someone likes it on Twitter doesn't mean God is pleased. That we are not here to build a brand, we are here to build the kingdom of God. That we are not here to get a blue check mark by our name. We're here to end our journey and hear God say, well done. Crowds don't confirm purpose. Jesus chooses 12. And no matter what listing of the 12 you read, you're going to find there are two commonalities in the listing of the 12. Can I teach Bible? Yeah. Whether it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, or Luke's second version in Acts, whenever you read the names of the disciples, the 12, there are two commonalities. Now, there may be some differentiation in how they are named, but there are two commonalities whenever you see that list. I'm going to tell you what they are. The list always starts with Peter and always ends with Judas. Let me show you, whenever you make a list 
of the 12 disciples who followed, Judas is always on the list. You can't gather disciples and not have Judas. You almost caught where I'm headed. Then anytime you get a gathering of disciples together, Judas is somewhere on the list. I, I probably shouldn't say this with prospective students in the room, uh, uh, but Judas is inevitable. I've been pastoring 25 years now. I'm about to tell you what nobody taught me in seminary. And that is that every church has a Judas. I don't mean to discourage you. Every committee, you're going to find a Judas. Every alto section. Has a Judas. And when you leave Candler, you're going to run into some Reverend Judas. You're going to meet Deacon Judas. You're going to meet Sister Judas. Brother Judas. And sadly, Judas may share your last name. Wouldn't it be nice if we could keep Judas off the list? But you can't make a list of followers and not have Judas. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, though. Judas ain't the only name on the list. Here's what I want to drop on you. Don't let the inevitability of Judas cause you to deny the reality of Peter. Don't miss that there's a Matthew out there, that, that there's a Thomas out there, that, that there, there are some faithful folk. And as you get into ministry, let me encourage you, don't quit because you met Judas. Don't resign because of Judas. Don't doubt your calling because of Judas. Don't quit ministry because of Judas. Because somewhere, there's some other faithful folk. And we allow the sting of Judas to cause us to forget the others. Can I push this? I'm almost done. When Luke tells the story of the calling, he, he muddies the water even more because Luke says that Jesus called these 12 after spending all night in prayer. He prayed all night and still got Judas. Hold on, God. Because I thought if I prayed right, you'd keep Judas off my resume. I thought, thought if, if I was faithful over a few things, that I wouldn't have to deal with a Judas. If I gave three years of my life in seminary, I ought to avoid some Judas if, if I read my Bible and I, I'm nice to folk I don't even like on general Christian principle. I don't cuss like I used to, don't slap folk like I want to, God. I shouldn't have to deal with Judas. He prays all night. Now, what you had to ask is, why does Jesus pray all night? Well, he prays all night for the same reason we pray when we've got difficult decisions to make because we want to make certain that our decision lines up with the will of God. Yeah. Everybody in here knows about making the decision that wasn't bathed in prayer. Yeah. You ain't got to wave. You can wink. I said, no. <laughs> so Jesus prays so that his decision will be lined up with the will of God and still got Judas. 
the scary thought is what if Judas is part of God's will? What if Judas is part of the providential plan? What if Judas is assigned by God? Because Judas plays a role in setting up the glory of the resurrection. If there's no Judas, there's no betrayal. If there's no betrayal, there's no crucifixion. If there's no crucifixion, there ain't no empty tomb. If there's no empty tomb, there's no glory of God. And so God says in order to get to the empty tomb with the glory of the resurrection, you first got to deal with the Judas because Judas is the one that pushes you into the glory of God. They're not going to teach you this in systematic theology, but you need Judas. Judas teaches you how to pray. Judas makes you fast in ministry. Judas is the one that sets up the glory of God through the work God has assigned you to do. It's Judas who teaches you no weapon formed against you shall prosper. It's Judas who reminds you they that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's Judas who affirms that greater is God in you than God outside of you. It is Judas who reminds you that weeping only endures for a night, but joy will come in the morning. It's Judas who sets up the glory. And Judas is inevitable and it may be part of God's plan. So I've got some bad news for you, and I'm done. Well, I'm a Baptist preacher. I don't, uh. You're going to have some and Judas. You're going to have a series of seasons in your life with Judas and Judas. An MDiv and Judas. A THD, PhD, D men and Judas. A congregation you went into joyfully to serve and Judas. Sacrificing of money you could have made being a government contractor and Judas and lies, and betrayal, and deception, and criticism, and disrespect. That's the bad news. Here's the good news, though, that I know those two words will discourage you. I know and Judas will make you want to quit. I know and Judas makes you want to give up. I know and Judas hurts. I know and Judas makes you wonder, was it all worth it? Here's the good news, though. For those two words and Judas, there are two more that will always show up on your resume. I know the reality of and Judas. I came by to tell you the power of but God. <laughs> But God, and dealing with hurt, but God, and Judas, but God. Formed against you shall prosper. Oh, yeah, that's it.
listen. God will do what he said he would do. He will stand by his word. Come on, sing it with me. He will come through. God will do what he said he would do. He will stand by his word. He will come through. God will do what he said he would do. He will stand by his word. I know it's gonna come through. God will do what He said. Oh, yeah, and back. Yes, He will. Yes, He will. <laughs> but God, yeah, yeah. Let us pray. Holy God. You knew us before we took our first breath. You uttered your living word and brought forth light, love, and life. You gathered us from the dust of the earth and called us your people. You sent us into the world to proclaim your mighty and wondrous deeds. You are with us even now as we continue our call. We thank you, God, that your love never ends. Even when we turn from you, you, God, are always near. Strengthen us that we might be loyal to your call, that we might be givers of your grace, and may your steadfast love be known to all your children. Then, Lord, be with those of us who are hurting and grieving those who find the days harder to navigate and the nights filled with deep-hearted struggle. Give us hearts of courage and songs of your grace that we might rest in strength of your presence. We offer these prayers and so many others in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Can everyone just stand for this last part? Come on, y'all know it. Come on. God will do what he said he would do. He will stand by his word. He will come through. God will do what he said he would do. He will stand by his word. He will come through. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. No, 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 it won't work. No. wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power, from now and from eternity. The redeemed of the Lord who love the Lord, who waited his return, said amen. to our worship talk back we will give our preacher about two minutes to just take a breath and I know some may want to come and greet him in two minutes we will sit together and be in conversation with our preacher for all who will stay reminder there will be lunch following the talk back downstairs in